Um, well, I suppose they've already said most about what I'm doing, but um, I suppose the work the foundation is doing, TBA21 is my laboratory. And uh, I work with people and I work with artists, not with particles. But they're just as uncontrolled one from the other. But the interesting thing about engaging in experiments is you never can fail. An experiment is just the process where our collective knowledge comes into a line of thought and working with different ever-evolving ideas until you arrive at a result. And it cannot fail and it cannot also be perfect. I think in the world of art, the way I look around me today and the way it's evolving into this highly commercialized entity, people are escaping from that into more of the unknown because that's really where art grew out of originally. And if I look back at Leonardo as a great artist, he was also a multi-dimensional artist involved in a lot of scientific experiments. And these two things came together. So no nothing that we're doing here is particularly new. Um, but if you arrive at, a, when I get to a result, and for instance, working first with Olafur and David, we talked a lot, we theorized a lot, we came with a lot of ideas together. I had seen this amazing um, horizon line that he did in a beautiful exhibition in Reykjavik in Iceland. And I kept wanting to have this work installed in a different way because it was in a museum with four columns and it had an exit door and it, there was an emergency exit sign and somehow all of this, although the work was very beautiful, it disturbed one's enjoyment of it. And uh, I met David AJ and I really appreciated his sense of aesthetic. But having discussed trying to create a pavilion specially for this particular artwork, we came to a problem at uh, the Venice Biennial where the room that we had been allocated was changing and I called both David and Oliver up and said, we have six weeks in which we have to create a pavilion and we have to build it and we have to install it in Venice. And this was, I suppose, a bit of an experiment itself because getting anything done in Italy is anyway an experiment. Uh, but uh, we managed it, we did it. And we didn't really have time to think about were we getting it right? Was it going to be perfect? Was it going to be a success? And I think that from my point of view, when I lost that target, I started to think, I realized that we were getting better. We were learning because you just let go of trying to be right all the time. And taking the courage from experimentation and moving into this area, my job was to find a location for the, for the pavilion. And after being in Venice a couple of times, I landed on the island of San Lazaro, which belongs to the Armenians. And they made a little space available to us, and we managed to build this pavilion just in time for the opening of the Venice Biennial. And we were very happy about that, but we also realized, well, we hadn't had time to understand what that whole experiment had meant. And I got to the what's next, because that's the wonderful nature of the experiment, is that you realize this is a process. So the moment you come to a result, you want to go what's next. And what's next for me was moving into Lopud, to an island in Croatia. And I wanted to integrate a third dimension into that, which was the landscape. I wanted to know, would this enhance the landscape? Would the landscape enhance the pavilion, the art project, Oliver's horizon line? We took the color of the light of Lopud and the sunsets and the sunrises there and reconfigured the horizon line into new colors and a new dimension in new life. And now you have to go to Dubrovnik and take a little boat and you have to walk through a field of olive trees, find a little path, it's not very well marked, and eventually you'll get to this pavilion and you enter it and you've taken your time to get there and therefore the appreciation of it includes the landscape. So that was another part of my experiment. And all whilst we've been doing that for the last two years, I've been working with Matthew on an idea to create another pavilion. And well, he just, his, his way of approaching it, because this is a man who is fascinated by the universe and is fascinated by science and the cosmic creation of the world and our, our universe that we live in. And he confuses me. And I, I, I really, most of the time when I talk with Matthew, I don't understand what he's saying. And I love that because for me, learning and, and involving and diving deep into projects 
has been always more attractive to me when I really don't understand what it is I'm getting into. And so the, Matthew was the perfect partner for this next stage. And um, he will explain to you and show you in great detail his project, a model of which is here. But as you can see, it's lost the box. It's lost the architect. It has become the architecture. So the art and architecture dialogue is now sort of become even more organic or more refined in a way, more confused in another. And we're interpreting it now with an additional layer of what is performance and music. And now we're delving into this area of um, creating, working with musicians, working with movement, dancers, choreographers. And this is just now another experiment for me. How to integrate these things, because like Leonardo, he was integrating all of the anatomy and dissections and the study of the body into his painting, but also how, you know, the creation of helicopters and architecture and all his other interests. So for me, again, this is a repetition of trying to bring new components into further experiments. Um, I've also worked with Christoph Schlingensieb, and he's a performance artist in a way. He's a director, actually, of opera and theater and... Uh, and he said to me, I want to be an artist. I said, okay, no problem. Let's work on that idea. And so the multidisciplinary approach that I take in all these projects maintains this flow of energy and keeps me driven by the type of projects that I can do. And I think that um, many collectors today try to, you know, put things together in their mind, but they're, they're what's already packaged in things like art fairs. I stay away from art fairs because they terrify me. I, I don't want to have so many images in my mind. I want to create the images from within. And somebody said to me the other day, well, you have to be a very sophisticated and experienced collector to get into the realization of projects the way you do. And I said, no, on the contrary, it'd probably be better if you didn't, weren't a collector and you weren't really somebody with a lot of art experience because helping projects come together and Hans Ulrich has a long list. He's even published a book of unrealized projects. We're looking for people to help us realize these projects. And I think everybody can do that. And I really want to not over humble myself, but I really believe that every single person in this room could become a producer of one of these incredible art projects without any difficulty whatsoever. So, you know, it's really easy, but you have to take courage in the fact that you will not have a, a, you know, a success or a failure. You will not have the opportunity of deciding in advance, will I like this? Some people don't want to get into commissions because they are afraid that what if I don't like it at the end? How am I going to tell the artist that I don't like the piece he's created, especially for me? This is a real dilemma. And um, the choice is yours to get involved in something that you can't necessarily control. Needless to say, you pick the artist that you admire, you try and work out a project in advance, you have enough stages to get out of things. I mean, Matthew and I never really wanted to get out of this, relation, this project because it was a magic project from the beginning. But, you know, there are ways of, 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 you know, leaving it up to move on to something else. But I do encourage people to move out of what we look at the perfection of a beautiful installation in a museum. Museums try to be perfect. Everything is presented in such and such a way. Catalogues are, you know, prepared and beautifully outlaid. I don't want that. I think that the organic process of the creative process that I love and that I like to work with is somewhat coming out of a different realm. And it is experimental. And um, we're here to talk about experiments. So I'd like to introduce you to Matthew Ritchie, who's actually an English-born gentleman, lives in New York, um, works out of a studio in New York, and so should be much more often in England. And um, so we're very proud that this new project will have a presentation in the UK next summer. And, um, but I'd really rather that Matthew went ahead and explained to us how he came to this and how he came to this project. Thank you, Francesca. Thanks. Thank you. And without slides. Uh, no slides. Yeah, no <laughs> slides. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. Um, one of the things that's kind of my work is really about is this idea of uh, synthesis. And in a way, 
So what I automatically do in any situation, any context, is I start trying to synthesize and absorb all of the information. So something like this is like sort of releasing a killer whale in a kind of a school of fish. I've been just glutted on information. And then I'm trying to pull out all the little bits and pieces that have come out of it. And one of the things that you sort of keep hearing, these kind of resonant themes that Olafur has been sort of pointing towards, um, there's um, Hans Ulrich who keeps saying it's only just begun. Um, uh, everything is context is something that's been coming up a lot. Um, entertainment relies on ambiguous propositions, something Steven Pinker said. And uh, Joseph Grigley said, I think, the most pertinent thing of all uh, yesterday, which is, can you teach a monkey to fish? And this project is sort of about the idea of, can you teach a monkey to fish? My son, who is three years old, his favorite character is Curious George. And there's actually a book about how Curious George learns to fish. And it's sort of one catastrophic failure after another, like he tries to make a fishing line out of a broom handle and he ties a nail to it and he falls in the water. And it's like, and that, but what you see in that process and what fascinates my son, I think, is the idea of like no experiment is a failure. Like you cannot really experiment because what you're doing is you're articulating the world. And that is sort of the, the thing that I'd like to bring to it at the end of this in a way. It's not, it's not a summary, but it's a kind of counter or complementary proposition, which is that content and context are really indissolubly linked. That the, the place that you are defines what you can see, not in a relativistic sense, but in a very real, specific sense. And that there's a reason for this. And um, I'm, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of context, especially in the light of a structure like this. One of the things that came out of the 20th century was uh, a specific kind of dynamic, which we now live in. And you think of a, a building like this, well, it's going to be gone. This is a temporary situation. Now, we all understand the idea of temporality, but that is not something that's existed throughout human history, except in a very general sense. The specific scientific understanding of temporality is linked to the idea of thermodynamics. And it was the thermodynamic discoveries of the 19th century that were really the operating language of the 20th century. It's a, it was a thermodynamics. It's built, all the experiments you've seen here today rely on the fact that thermodynamics works that when I say something, you can hear it. That when I say it, the way that you hear it, perhaps, and then comprehend it on a neural level, as you maybe use the mirror neurons that we talked about yesterday, to make a little model of me in your head, and then you make a little model of you, and you kind of do what I'm doing. So you're all right now kind of imitating me inside your head. For those of you that weren't yesterday, you've got a little kind of TV show. And by doing that, you get a kind of sense of what's going on. This is how we register reality. And the whole thing relies on this cascade of thermodynamic events one thing after another. And what's the other thing we know about thermodynamics? Well, it leads to death, the end of things. As things change, they lose their energy, they become more entropic, and they also become more the same. So the more, it's like sort of the, when you go to school, at the beginning, everything is interesting. It's no wonder that by the time you're 15, you've had the same experience over and over and over and over and over again with no diversity, so it starts to flatten out. This is a classic entropic tale. So, as a culture, we sort of start to notice the thermodynamics operating. We also notice that it sort of builds things. This process is not entirely about reducing things to nothing, to dust. We notice that things like crystals form, um, and that's a thermodynamic process. It's not against thermodynamics, because something new is being built. Building and falling apart are the two polarities of thermodynamics. There's only one exception to the law of entropy, which we'll get to later. So the 20th century was really a, a war between these two modes expressed through first the building of impossible monuments. You know, this is Stalin. This is uh, Germania, Hitler's idea of the new Germany. It's, of course, the famous monument. And then sort of we tear them all down, and then we build them all up again. Now we need new monuments, new geometric forms, new perfected crystalline shapes. The one in the middle is the famous Phillips Pavilion, Paris, the St. Louis Arch and the Expo. And then we tear them apart again. And then we, or we, we create conditions which guarantee that they will be torn down. And then we build some more interesting structures. In this case, the most absurd example, all these buildings in Doha and the United Arab Emirates, which are actually being built in the sea, in the full knowledge that within 50 years they will be completely flooded. So there is especially this island, which is supposedly going to be populated entirely by British pop stars and British footballers. It's David Beckham over there, Elton John over there. It's called The World. And The World, this actual structure, is being built, and it will actually go underwater. It's like this is a kind of built into the premise of it. Even our fantasy life has now started to mirror this. You can't think of a major action picture, you know, the ones that are really popular entertainment. 
and this goes back to this idea of the ambiguous proposition, that does not include a sequence of some major monument or city or example of our civilization being torn apart, and we feel this deep visceral satisfaction as we watch you know, the effort of thousands, millions perhaps, being torn and destroyed to bits. So you know, this is uh, Shanghai, that's the Lord of the Rings. Then we've got, um, this is Katrina, that's a Steven Spielberg, minority report. This is the new so-called Freedom Tower, which is apparently going to consist almost entirely of concrete. Um, as you see sort of where it's really copied from is the Lord of the Rings. So we have this kind of idea of this constant, um, now a, a really a fantasy language, of monumentality versus ruin. No artist understood this better than uh, the American artist Robert Smithson, who proposed uh, simultaneously a monument in Antarctica and this famous piece called Buried Woodshed. He understood that the relationship of the two is indissolubly linked. But really, although Smithson was perhaps the most famous American artist to, and he had to most sort of like coherently address entropy, it was understood at the beginning. It was understood as an inherent property of thermodynamics that, you know, that as Jerry, the, the surrealist poet, wrote, wrote we shall not succeed in demolishing everything unless we demolish the ruins as well. And the only way I can see of doing that is to use them to put up a lot of fine, well-designed buildings. Um, in other words, we have enacted this term. It was understood at the beginning, and we spent an entire century working it out. And this note, these are sort of two classic examples. This is the Mertzbau by Kurt Schwitters, and then, of course, the uh, reactor chamber at Chernobyl, which I think, for me, embodies the kind of inherent instability in the thermodynamic model as a kind of class of construction. Now, at the same time as that was going on through the 20th century, a parallel but not unrelated revolution was going on in physics. It started with the thermodynamics and gradually it was all being taken apart as well. So you start with this very nice thing we all know about the universe. Look up, see the night sky. And the night sky we think of as some sort of, it builds, as build stars are being made all the time. So we can see it in the real world. Like here's the real world, there's birds sort of, and now we see perhaps something that's a little more familiar to us as a kind of image of entropy. It's like birds scattering across a, a plane. We see change in motion. Then we get down to the sort of more molecular level. These are screw diagrams of molecules. We get down to the plasma where we see, ah, oh, yeah, right down in the, the atomic chamber, the plasma is venting particles, great thermodynamics. And then something a little bit strange, once you start to look a little more closely, starts to happen is there's a directionality in all of this. These structures have a, a twist, a little kink, and it keeps them moving forward. And we start to go, Wait, why do they always move forward? Why can't they move backwards? And we start to address the subject of time, which Neil Turok talked about. And then we get down inside the particles, and we find that that category is even more weird, because particles don't really obey the laws of time or the laws of thermodynamics. They do something entirely different. Everything in this room is simultaneously a thermodynamic event and a quantum event. And these two worlds are like the sort of strangest married couple in history. They don't really, they've never talked to each other, but somehow they manage to pay the mortgage and send the kids to school and build a house and they do all sorts of things, but they never really bridge this gap. No one really knows how things get from being quantum, which is a state of indeterminacy, to being real. But we know that the quantum world exists because we keep, we're able to find it with our telescopes and our computers. We keep noticing it everywhere. So we've got this very strange instability starts to emerge in the middle of the 20th century. Um, based on this is a sub diagram of how that works. And at the end of the 20th century, we reach where we are sort of now, this moment where we begin to be able to change that. This is a diagram of something called quantum state holography, where we're able to create insta unstable quantum states and keep them there. And when we can do that, we can see that there's actually not one fixed level of reality. So this has gone from being a completely speculative thought to something that can actually be repeated in the laboratory. We can make quantum states, and we can make them choose what they want to be. And we can, they can be all kinds of things. So this thing that's generating the universe, that we would like to think is this very ordered procession of thermodynamic events. Crystals grow, things fall apart. It's not like that at all. Underneath, there's another game working where everything can change. Everything can read everything else. In this party, everybody knows everybody. Everybody is friends with everyone. Everyone can become everyone. So this is the model that um, most people think about today as the universe. So it starts with the Big Bang. It's a quantum event then it generates the anisotropic uh, sky, it's the microwave radiation, that's the sort of green bit. And then it kind of gradually bells out, and this is sort of the, what Neil Turok was talking about earlier today, the dark energy keeps pushing it out, it comes from somewhere. And you might well ask, you know, it's this lovely diagram, but it has this inherent problem, which is what's outside the bell? What's outside? 
In other words, what is extrinsic and what is intrinsic. And these two terms, extrinsic and intrinsic, are really kind of the basis of the project that I'm going to talk about. Because this moment of intrinsicness and extrinsicness per permeates every layer of the universe. So at that quantum moment of indecision, where two things begin to change from one to another, there's this possibility of multiple futures. This is, something, this is a different way of think, talking about what Neil talked about. When you have multiple futures, you begin to generate what we could call an imaginative space, which is where an artist can begin to work. The most um, notorious example of this is called the many worlds interpretation. The many worlds interpretation is that all possible futures are generated, all possible versions of the universe are generated, and they all coexist in some sort of infinite landscape of infinite possibilities. Um, there's various classes of this you know, that goes from kind of all the ones you can think of to all the ones that are possible to all the ones that might be possible and the ones that are possible in various sort of scales. But the idea is that you know, every possible future, you might recognize this one from the, there's the Planet of the Apes, that future came true. And there's this one, the day after tomorrow, that future came true. And even the future came true where Charlton Heston made disaster movies three consecutive years about alternate futures. So is this sort of, um, you might sound, you're going, oh wait a second, this sounds awfully like all those bad science fiction films I've seen with Ben Affleck where he goes back in time and steps on a butterfly and comes back into the future and his girlfriend's lost her job or something. But it's generally accepted, as this is sort of one of these spurious sort of pieces of information that you get to throw up in a lecture from some sort of unnamed source that guarantees the veracity of what I'm saying. But everything that I'm saying is true. This is just, or, or believed to be true. Lots of physicists now believe the many worlds interpretation is, a, is really a plausible alternative. So how do we move past that into the 21st century? So we're sort of stuck with we've got the thermodynamic world and then this crazy quantum world where not only is everything possible, everything actually happens. Everything happens. And what they, where they come together is this idea that energy and matter and information are the same thing. This is where it starts to get real again. And what does this mean? You know, we say, oh, everything is information. You know, this table is information. Well, that's fine, you know, everything's information. It's kind of one of those great slogans you can print it on your t-shirt. But what it means is that if you can read something, you can make it causal. You can make it do something. And that is, becomes this question of information equals causality. You have to unlock information for it to have meaning. And that gets back for an artist to the idea of like, what is an artist doing if not taking physical matter and unlocking the potential information inside it. What I do is I take things that have no value and I turn them into something that has a legible language. It becomes a language and there's a word, a very big word I'm going to use later called semiosographics. I'm going to say it now because when you hear it later you'll what the hell was that? So these are the, and this is a fundamental shift in our culture and I feel that we're inside the kind of structure. It's the kind of place where we're going to be able to look at those things, like a great big telescope. So we have these two sets of dualities in the 20th century that are very commonplace, you know, representation and abstraction, space and time, monument and ruin. And in the 21st century, these things are going to all change. They're all going to become complementary. And the operating language of the 21st century will be built out of these complementarities, which is content and moment. Content being the information latent in a situation. Moment being your experience of that information information and causality, you know, being the same thing mirrored. And finally, this concept of intrinsic structure, which means that everything is the universe. If you say the universe is a number, that number is one. Everything is a fraction of that one. It has to always add up to one. There's not one plus a bit extra. That's what universe means, uni. So we're in that thing. We're a block of information, a block of information that moves through space and time by re recognizing itself and advancing itself forward. Now this has a, this obviously leads one sort of, it's, very, it's a bit of a mind bender, you're like, ha, where is it? If it's not, if it's here and everywhere, what's the edge? How do we define the edge of the universe? Now this is an old, 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 old question. This is a, you know, Kepler's first attempts to sort of nest it in a series of solids. And yet what's amazing about this is that on an intuitive level, Kepler was kind of right. The universe is a kind of mathematical, it is closed in, the, in a mathematical sense. This boundary, this is the anisotropic survey again of the microwave radiation, there's no real edge to this boundary. It's a representation of what we can see. And beyond what we can see, we can't see. That's what we've learned through looking at, through our telescopes. We just can't get there. We suspect that either the universe is so big 
that we can never ever reach the so-called edge of the time, or something else is going on, which is where my interest gets triggered again. So a lot of suggestions about this. The soccer ball universe looks remarkably like Kepler's universe. We've got dark matter and dark energy there pushing it apart in the dark. They're doing something else very weird. They're, they're here. No one can find it. It's like sort of having the burglar you know, in the horror film where you go through all the rooms in the house and then the phone rings. It's like your number. That's what dark matter is like. <laughs> And we've got the 10 or 26, which is the one that uh, Neil was talking about being folded up inside a little tiny ball where all the, the, at, the, uh, the extra dimensions are right here too, but they're underneath your chairs. All these are resolved in something called M-theory. But still there's a kind of question like, how does this, this thing we're talking about, this recursion, this self-recognition occur inside a closed volume? And it comes across something that I think Neil's going to talk about in more technical terms, something called the holographic principle which is that this idea that the universe, and all of this is all of this stuff, everything I'm talking about is supposed to end up in this structure. So it's, it's not an, I'm not leading you around just along a garden path. Every single part of this is, is considered by this structure. It's basically the idea that you have a black hole, and black holes are infin infinitely sucking in everything. But they're really small. So where does it go? It doesn't go into a pipe or a door. or a, All of these things involve conjuring up some magical solution where everything gets sent away, far away, and comes back again through some other white hole. Because you can't really violate the idea that the universe is inherently linked. Oh, dear. See, this, that's the end. Yeah, the black hole just, oh, it's back again. Um, so you can't get rid of information. So the idea is that how do you fit it all in there? Well, imagine everything in this room, instead of actually having a volume, just has an area. It's just a projection of the true dimensional coordinates of it. It's like a map. We are like a map of everything else, the things that are all hidden. In other words, the universe is a kind of picture. Now, this is something, of course, becomes very interesting to an artist when it's proposed a theory. And there are two kind of approaches that I want to talk about. There's lots of approaches that artists are taking. This one is a, 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 especially given the situation, I thought this was nice. There's a trajectory of a kind of linearity. Like you deal with the universe in a thermodynamic way. It's a line. So we've got Dali. He's, these are in chronological sequence. He made this painting of himself uh, painting a picture while a cat leapt through the air in a glass of water. Picasso saw it, wanted to copy it, so he made some drawing with light. Jackson Pollock saw those pictures. This is all very well documented, and so I've got to be better than Picasso because I'm also bald, but I'm now American, so therefore I'll do something bigger. Then Richard Serra, who was American and wanted to beat Pollock, said, well, I will do it out of lead wearing a mask. And then here we have Matthew Barney and the Serpentine sort of taking this idea of this trajectory of this line drawn in space. It's, a, it's the artist as athlete, the artist as a physical manifestation of the universe. Then we have this other model of artistic practice, which is to do more with the idea of sort of recursion or, or creating a space where the person who comes into it becomes a kind of a sense memory of all of the experience. So here we have Robert Smithson, that's Yayo Kusama, that's Dan Graham, and there's Olaf Elias, and do honor to him for his extraordinary structure. So these two modes kind of have an uneasy relationship, and it, almost like a philosophical difference, because one, in a sense, you could say this is to do with quantum recursion, in a very obvious kind of, but, you know, quite plausible analogy, and the other is to do with thermodynamics, and the two things aren't really coming together. So my own work, I'll just show you a very few short slides, is to do with trying to create structures that can embody both of those two tendencies and bind them into an information space that you, can, you are then inside. I use all kinds of media, all kinds of structures, but common to everything that I do, as you can see from this model, is an idea of the line carrying information through space, an infinitely recursive and infinitely adaptable space. So and this is a, a recent work where you, so it starts to become an arc. I've ground, found myself while in the dialogue with Francesca, being drawn to the possibility of an architectural space, a space that you could actually move through and inside that would contain this language. And I also reached the physical limits of what can be done with an inscribed line and say a metal, like this is a thing, it was held up, it's like three tons in space. It's a nightmare. You need something that generates its own logic or it, ceases, or it stops being an intrinsic language and starts to require an extrinsic language. In other words, you have to start making other adaptations to it to make it hold together, which is the opposite of what I intend. So when we, we were talking, Olafur built his beautiful pavilion. I thought, well, we're going to have to do an anti-pavilion. We're going to have to do sort of something that's kind of the opposite. That's the universe in a bottle. Instead of the star in a jar, which you saw yesterday, we're going to do the universe in a building. And it went from, you know, the first thing it was was like, well, there you go, universe in a building, easy, done. 
But it's, it's got this horizon problem, you see? It's, got, it's an outside. You're outside it, looking at it. That's no good. So then we thought, oh, we'll make it an auditorium where you can sort of look at the universe on these kind of chairs. But then you've still got this kind of relationship where that, the, the place you're looking from is not part of the thing itself, which is the true nature of reality. Where we are is the place, and where we are looking from is also the place that you get this kind of duality. So, and the third thing it has to do for me is it has to include all of the stories and all of the information of all human culture. And you have to be able to read those things, like a dictionary. So all of this kind of language that I've evolved is about something that's called this semi essographic language. It's turning what's called a logographic or glottographic language, which is a language that's a line. It's a thermodynamic language, which is how we speak, how we write, everything is linear, into what's called a semi essographic language, which is a picture language. And the only thing that stops all paintings being picture languages is that they don't talk to each other. You know, the, they don't, the Caravaggio, you can't take the guy out and put him into the you know, the Picasso, and then he gets to both walk off hand in hand and they sit in the Mondrian, and it all makes sense. It doesn't make sense because the artists haven't constructed uh, intertranslatable space. But if they did, it would technically be a sort of semi graphic language. Something, but the, what makes that different from a logographic language is whatever end you start, wherever you come from, it makes sense. You start with any letter in the middle of any sentence on any page. You can go forward, backwards, in and out, and it will always make sense because it's a, it is a holographic language. So this is what I came up with. It was a drawing in space. And that was the moment that I said, oh, I'm going to need some help with this. And we started talking to uh, David Ajay, the British architect, was enormously helpful in the early phases of this. We went through a number of translations, and he was sort of very much a collaborator. And he passed me over to Daniel Bosia at Arup, who is a uh, extremely gifted geometrician and thinker, abstract thinker. And he passed me over to Ben Aranda. I've been all around the world meeting these people, you know, here and there, London. Where is the, where is the person who can help me with this? Daniel said, well, it just so happens I know these art architects in New York. They've never really built a, an actual building. They built all sorts of interesting structures. And it turned out they were, of course, a few blocks walk from where I was, just showing you that the universe is truly holographic and you're always right next to the thing you need. So I'd like to ask them to come up here and talk about, oh, in a little while, about how, how we made this structure. But the other thing that was going on was a brand new theory of the universe was emerging at the same time. And because this is an omnivorous information system, is an information system designed to eat information, including itself if necessary, it had to include the latest, greatest, best theory of how everything works. And that's where I'd like to introduce Neil to come back and talk about this idea of physics as a language and a structure that builds upon itself to generate meaning, and especially the theory that he's talked about. And while he does that, I'm just going to put up this which, uh, animation. This is my effort to sort of make a very early prototype of what goes on um, before, or the, the moment the old universe begins to collapse while he's setting up. I'll, uh, I'll talk about this. This quantum state, everything will come back together to this quantum state of uncertainty. We will begin to feel, it was described by his partner, things start to get very, very strange indeed. Sort of like a kind of living acid trip. They begin to drift away from reality. The up will become down. All of the coordinates will vanish that we know and be replaced by quantum uncertainty itself, embodied in a form. I'll keep so if we just wait for one more minute, we're going to have the two membranes coming together, I hope. <laughs> oh yeah, go for it. 